Okay, so we are continuing on our journey, the narrows through the, uh, what do you call it? roadside attractions in America and you know, everywhere else that we go. Tonight we're going to visit a place called Blue Earth, Minnesota on our little journey. And we're going to be looking at this fella right here, the Jolly Green Giant. Okay, brother of Paul Bunyan, all right. This fella is 55 feet tall, this statue right here. And go to the next one right quick there. And see, you see a little dude. Okay, that one, uh, no one's ever seen the backside of the Jolly Green Giant. <laughs> right? It was only on a can. Well, they had to get some artists and come up with a few different variations of his derriere to uh, come up with what he would look like from the backside. Uh, in 1979, a fellow named Paul Hedberg had that statue built. He was a radio station host in Blue Earth, Minnesota. And part of his radio show was to welcome travelers as they came through Blue Earth, Minnesota. And he would interview them as they kind of passed through town. And he would give out cans of green giant vegetables to them from their local cannery. And what happened was, is he put that statue there when the I-90 had passed by Blue Earth, because like many of the big highways like I-10 and all these big interstates, before they came along, it was all like Route 66 and stuff like that, you know, and people went through towns and stopped. And, then, and as the highways went by, like in El Monte, for instance, when the 10 freeway went by El Monte, they didn't have an off-ramp at the time. It was like from somewhere that way all the way to somewhere that way, and the city of El Monte, kind of fell into, uh, well, what El Monte turned into, amen? And then eventually, you know, they got off round. So by then, all the mom and pop's places kind of, you know, died out. So that's why when, whenever you're traveling around off the main highways and you get off into these roadside attractions, they all look like crap now. You know, they're all closed down or beat up or something like that. And, but every now and then, things like this happen. Now, the radio station in uh, Blue Earth, and the cannery are both gone. They no longer exist anymore, probably because of the I-90. But that fella right there still gets 50,000 visitors a year. And there's also a little green giant museum and a play area. And apparently you can play with the, the jolly green giant. And some fun facts are this. His feet are six feet long and they wear a size 78 shoe. Right? Another fun fact is Blue Earth, Minnesota claims to be the birthplace of the ice cream sandwich. That's what they say. But there's no 55 foot tall ice cream sandwich anywhere. But tonight we're going to talk about a different giant. And he isn't green and he isn't jolly either. In fact, we're going to talk about giants in general. Um, do you have a picture of that giant here? There's a good picture of that giant right there. You all know him by the name of Goliath, that's right. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, him and David and just the way that whole battle went down. There's one more really creepy one. There you go right there. That's a cool one. And I want you to take note of that spear right there that he's got, and in particular the spear tip on there, and uh, which is why we have this 88-millimeter uh, German artillery piece right here. This is from World War II. And... Uh, it actually weighs something like 20 pounds, this piece right here. And as we get into this, you're going to kind of get an idea of our giant. Anyway, these giants that we're going to talk about, let's see, I wrote a few names of giants like depression, finances, jobs, relationships, grief, fear, anxiety, and I'm sure there's others that you guys can, you know, come up with. But one thing that we all have in common is we all face stinking giants. Amen? And so tonight... Whatever they, whatever they might be called, we're going to find a way to defeat them. Amen? Let's open a word of prayer and dive in. And Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord. We thank you for our cool little journey through these uh, backwoods attractions there, Lord, and how you turned them into something really cool for us, Lord. And so tonight as we talk about giants, Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to teach us and show us by faith how to fight these giants. In Jesus' name, amen? So here's the opening. How can you fight giants in three easy steps? Three easy steps, that's all. 
here's a quick poll. How many, how many have giants in their life right now that they're dealing with? Pretty much everybody, right? Okay, well, good news. Tonight you're going to learn how to kick a giant's butt. Kick a giant's big green butt. Amen? We're going to be looking at this in Samuel, 1 Samuel 17, of course. That's where our giant story is going to be coming from. And the first one is this. First fill in, the first step. Face the giant. It's one of the biggest, biggest mistakes we make is that we try to outrun them, try to move around them, try to come up with all kinds of ways except for facing them. We don't want to deal with it, right? Who wants to deal with giants? Giants are big and mean and scary and all that stuff. Well, first things first. Let's face the giants. We're going to identify what the giant is. Whatever your giant is, you need to call it something. It's got to have a name. And furthermore, another thing about giants is they usually travel in a pack. There's usually an army behind the giants. So, for instance, if uh, you're dealing with finance problems and stuff like that, you may have an army of job problems, depression, fear, anxiety that are behind that giant, as well as other things. Like maybe you have relationship problems that bring grief and anxiety. Maybe you're having trouble finding a job. That brings with it finances and then back to depression, which can also bring relationship problems. I mean, you know, see, when, when the giants are there, there's always something behind the giant, too, that we need to contend with. But as we go through this story, you're going to see that all them armies and stuff that are behind those giants, they're all a bunch of wimps, man. And when the giant falls, the army tends to skip rocks, too. But first things first, let's find out what the heck we're talking about here and who it is. So verse 17, I mean, chapter 17, verse 1 goes like this. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and they were gathered at Succoth. Sokab, which belongs to Judah, and they encamp between Soka and Azekah and Ephes Damon. <laughs> There's an M on the end of that. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah. This is where the battles are going to take place. So check this out. And they drew up a battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountainside on one side. Israel stood on a mountainside on the other side, and with a valley in between. So right here we have a valley of Elah right here. And, and we have a narrow road sign right at the end of our valley, which is kind of cool. So this is where it would be. And you kind of think about it in this, in this way, kind of like a, a football stadium. You know, you have the bleachers all around, and then you have the valley down below where all the battles would take place. And so the armies would stand on the sides, and then troops would go down and battle it out. People would come and watch all the battles and have barbecues and stuff. And they just watch like we watch football, except when people were tackled in these days, they didn't get back up. They were usually chopped up and, well, dead. So anyway, this is what they would do. Did anybody ever see, uh, I think it was called Troy with Brad Pitt? Okay, the very beginning, the two armies lined up out in the battlefield. They lined up in a ray. They're yelling at each other and banging on their shields. And then one side sent out that big old monstrous guy that came out there. Same deal that was happening. They probably ripped it off from the story right here. And then, then they said, send out one of your guys. And all their guys were looking at that big old monstrous guy growling and his teeth all filed down. And they're like, man, we're not gonna, we don't want to fight him. And so what'd they do? They called for, what was his name? Achilles. And Achilles was littler than him, like pretty much like those pictures right there. And what did Achilles do? Man, he ran right at him, jumped up, stuck a spear in his neck. And down went the giant. Perfect example of what happened here, except without the sling. Same idea, though, so you kind of get an idea of what's going on. So verse 4 says, A champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Okay, now, take a minute and look at what this is all about here. So a cubit could be, you know, I guess the average size is 18 inches. It could be 18 to 20 inches. What it was was the measurement between your elbow and your fingertip. That was a cubit right there. So they had 21 inches of what was called a long cubit. Because if you get somebody like, uh, hey, Fred, how you doing? Come on over here for a second, Fred. Let me show you guys something. Come on up here. All right, I need someone small. Amy, Amy you know, you don't have sleeves on. Come up here, Laura, real quick. I want to show you guys something. Now, you guys just stand facing that way. All right, you put this hand up. You put this hand up. Okay, so up you go. Okay, so put, them, put your elbows together. You guys see the difference there? 
Okay, so the, his cubit is longer than her cubit, right? So if you're going to buy some property and you're going to get 100 cubits of property for 100 bucks, which arm do you want measuring that? You want Fred's, right? Okay, now the other one they meant, hold on, the other one they mentioned was a span. Now open your hands like this. Okay, now a span is a measurement from the pinky to the thumb. That's called a span. So when you put those two spans together, you can see that one hand is smaller than the other hand, which makes this span smaller than that span. Amen. Let's all give them some love here for that. Okay. So if we use the 18-inch span, the, the average span, or the average cubit, and a span, which was half a palm, which was this measurement over here. Can you imagine having to measure stuff that way? But anyway, that's the way. Actually, it's not that, you know, you can kind of lay down there and you go like that. Anyway, that would put Goliath somewhere between about nine and a half feet and maybe ten and a half feet tall. Now, I took the liberty before church here of measuring that cross, and the very top of that cross is nine feet from the bottom of the stage up to the top of that cross. You can get kind of an idea of how big Goliath was, and David was just a youngster, so, you know, we're going to put David at maybe five feet tall or something like that, so he's just about half his size, amen? So Goliath would be a really huge guy big dude right like all of our giants in our life man the stuff that we're facing whether it's depression what did i list here depression finance jobs relationship grief fear anxiety all those things in our lives are a stinking nine ten foot tall giant man compared to other things that are going on in our life you know you got you got to pay bills and stuff like that and some of them could be you know pretty problematic but there's always that one giant man that just won't go away well there's more to giants, though. Like, for instance, this giant had a bronze helmet on his head. So, you know, anybody that's nine feet tall is going to have a really big dome, right? <laughs> like, big old head. There's a big old bronze helmet sitting on top of his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail that weighed, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. This is about 120 pounds. His, his coat of mail, you know, that's the little circle things or the little, uh, sometimes they put little pieces of metal and sew them together, you know, for to stop arrows and whatnot. They would wear them on the outside. That, just his shirt weighed more than David did. And this is what David was coming up with. Of course, giants are scary, man. But there's more. Wait, there's more. And he had, a, he had bronze armor on his legs and bronze javelin between his shoulders. So anytime we're looking at giants, the thought of fighting a giant is like the furthest thing from our mind because everything that we look at is well defended and big and bigger and, and something we just can't defeat. And it usually comes with something that really hurts. In this case, the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. So... A weaver's beam, 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 big, the big, long beam at the very top of a, what do you call those things? A lube, okay, huh? A lube, okay, like you go to the bathroom, lube, right? Okay, it's not the bathroom, it's the thing that's called, actually called a loom, but we'll go with what's known as loo. Thank you. Okay, they're like two and a okay, so like, you know, a baseball bat, you know the big end of a baseball bat? They're about that thick up there and about 10 to 13 feet tall. Now that roof right there at the very top is probably 10, 11 feet right there. So, so his spear, though if you look at that cross and the top of it being his head, then his spear, you know, would go up another two or three feet. And it was two and a quarter, like two and a half inches in diameter. It's like a fence post, man. But on the top of it, he had an iron spearhead that weighed 600 shekels, which is about 20 to 30 pounds. This little bad boy right here, this is an 88 millimeter uh, uh, German artillery round. I'm pretty sure it's not real because <laughs> we wouldn't want to drop it, right? Although we wouldn't know, <laughs> right? Maybe, maybe a flash. <laughs> That's about it. But this thing weighs about 20 pounds, maybe a little more than 20 pounds. So this thing would be on the tip of like a 12 foot long spear being chucked by a nine or 10 foot tall fella. Needless to say, if he chucked that thing, and you guys can come up here and pick it up after uh, church if you want to see just about how heavy that is. 
If you chuck that thing into a crowd, that thing would probably go through four or five guys before it finally stopped. I don't think shields would matter too much to a 20 pound pointed projectile that's being heaved by a big gigantic man, right? Though when you look at your giants, whoa, thought I was just about to kick that thing over. Boom. Be like a big boom and I'd be holding up the card <laughs> as I'm going down. <laughs> okay. I just think that's funny that we'll just leave. We'll probably take a picture of that right there next to an artillery shell. Only at the Thinking Roadhouse, praise the Lord. Anyway, and his shield bearer went before him, which I thought was funny because, you know, these, these champion dudes always had like a shield bearer. They would carry their stuff with them. Well, a shield bearer would probably maybe five, six feet tall or something like that. And here's this dude like nine or ten feet tall. There ain't much for him to hide behind. Because there's little dudes in front of him, not only that, carrying that big old shield in front of him. But the giants always have, like, w what this is about, just so we can all get our heads around this. When we're looking at our giants, you know, that maybe someone else can look at our giant and like, man, I don't know what you're getting so bent out of shape and worried about that giant for. But when we look at our giants, they have weapons and pointy things. They're, it's almost impossible to even conceive going against this giant. The way we view our giants is something that's impossible to defeat. Because even if we try to, to do this, they're going to stick a javelin in us, man. And if we try to run over there, they're going to chuck a spear at us. It's got a 20-pound tip on the end of it. If we try to attack them, they, I mean, we just try to, like, because they're so big, we try to, like, bite their ankles or something. They got bronze armor on their stinking legs. We're just going to break our teeth. The point is we can come up with all kinds of excuses why we don't try to attack and defeat our giants. And... Probably for very good reason, but I'm going to show you something tonight as we go through this stuff, and we're going to get something from David here. But look what he goes on to say. Then he stood and cried to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and your servants of Saul? You're a bunch of slaves. You think you can really defeat me? My name is Depression. You've been fighting me for years, or not even really fighting. You haven't even put up much of a fight. My name's anxiety. Just the thought of me makes you freak out, man. Start having panic attacks and you can't breathe and stuff like that. And you're going to line up and come out and battle me? Where did you grow that big old set of um, lemons? I don't know. Where to go with that one, all right? You're just a slave. You're a slave. You're a slave. And he goes, look, choose a man for yourselves and let him come out to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll be, we'll be your servants. If you can beat me up, I'll be your slave, which ironically is the truth. If we, if we defeat our giants, we're no longer slaves to them. They're slaves to us. We can lock them up, put them in jail somewhere, or throw them away. We can do whatever we want with them. If he's able to beat me and kill me, I'll be your slave. If, if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. So there's a threat. What if, you try to, what if we try to take on this giant? We lose. We're going to be in worse shape then than we are now. So I don't know, man. We better just keep being servants to our fear or whatever the heck it is. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight. I'm not, I don't, I'm not, your God has done nothing to me. And, and it's true because when we have giants that are still in our life, most likely we haven't unleashed our God on that giant yet. Still trying to deal with it in our own strength, whatever that is. The ways we kind of navigate around it, we try to run and hide. We make up all kinds of stories, pop pills, whatever it is that we have to do to try to keep our giant at bay. But if we really turn this over to the Lord, you're going to find out that, first of all, hey, you never had a prayer fighting that giant in your own strength. Because as soon as you learn and understand that it ain't our battle in the first place, the battle belongs to the Lord. All of a sudden, things start radically changing real quick. Now, remember, behind this guy was a big old army. And every time Goliath would run out there and yell all these taunts and curse at him and do all this stuff, these guys back there were just laughing at Israel. They thought it was funny because the guys in Israel were just shaking and trembling. In fact, it says here, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were dismayed. They didn't even know what to do. They were terrified. How do, you, how do you act in the presence of your giant? Are you all strong and brave and stuff in the face of your giant? Or are you all dismayed trying to figure out, what do I do? How do I do this? How do I figure that out? What do I do? And then 
fear starts to kick in. And then fear becomes another giant. And before long, you got your whole valley is full of giants. But there's always that one giant. And if we can take that one giant out, man, the other ones will see. And you'll see what happens here. And this is how we do it. Go, over, go with me over to Mark. This is where the faith comes in for you giant slayers or soon-to-be giant slayers out there. Look over here and mark with me. Mark something. 11 and 22. Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, period. That's what I got in my Bible. You got that one? Have faith in God. That's where it all starts right there, man. Faith in ourselves is kind of foolish in the face of a, a giant. And, and the fact is, for those of us that battle giants, I think we've all in this room probably battled giants and won at some point because we probably gave it over to God at some point. But then like we are hum in, as humans, we shrink back, man, and we forget. And that's going to be part of our next part here. that We forget all those battles that we already fought. And for some reason, this giant just looks so much bigger and badder than the last giant. Well, look what he says here. Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. That's a big, that's a pretty tall order telling that mountain over there to jump into the sea. About a big a about as tall an order as fighting a giant in your life, right? I mean, you probably have just as much luck getting a mountain to jump into the sea as you do killing a giant in your life. At least that's the perspective that we have right now at 10 minutes to 6 o'clock. Let's see what it looks like here a little bit later on. Your perspective might change. Just a, kind of look at it like this. You look, you, know, you look through binoculars and you like something binoculars, right? And everything's kind of blurry out there until you start adjusting and then all whoo, starts coming into focus you're like oh that giant don't look all that big and bad after all but when you look at them with binoculars and being in focus then giants can look really big right so check out the second part here the second film is this remember past victories our first step is face your giant name your giant know who it is know thine enemy amen don't try to, we got to quit trying to maneuver around stuff and okie doke this and okie doke that and live in fear and terror and, ugh, and all that stuff. At some point, you just got to stop, drop, and roll, dick, roll. Remember Dick Van Dyke? Anybody? Am I the only one? Okay. He used to say that. Well, because he was always on fire. But anyway, it was good, it was good advice if you've ever been on fire. I personally have, well, actually, I have been on fire now that I think about it. Strangely enough. So identify your giant. Give it a name. You know, stop messing around with, you know, this or that or whatever, excuses and blah, stuff like that. Stop and look at that giant and identify who that giant is and what it is. That's the beginning. So we, we can know what we're up against. Because sometimes it's hard to decipher between all the stuff going on around us and stuff. And, and the fact that we try to avoid that giant. You know, maybe it's been a while since we've seen him, even though we know that giant's always there. We kind of live in the shadow of that giant all the time. So it's time to stop with all that. Have some courage. Understand that we're going to look at that giant, just like if we look at that mountain. Tell that mountain to jump into the sea. We're going to have a little word with that giant here in a minute. But check this out. There's always, um, what do you call that, like, resistance. And, and it's not always from the giant. It's from people sometimes, people that maybe, maybe they don't mean to, but, man, they come at you with all kinds of negative junk, man, when you're, you're trying to get your head straight and you're trying to work into this thing, just like, just like the giant did over here. You're actually going to come and fight against me, and people will do that. And look what happens to David here. This is a, now, now, between the last verse and here, David's dad, you know, he was out tending sheep. David's dad sent for him to, to take some food and supplies to his brothers, Go to the front line, and David liked to go to the front. Like everybody liked to go to, the, like everybody likes to go to football games, right? He wanted to go and check out the battle, see what's going on, and so he went. And as he got there, Goliath was out there running his mouth, and David's like, "Who the heck is this uncircumcised Philistine talking smack against our Lord, man?" 
And, and this is where we kind of pick up the story. Because David was like, who the heck is this guy? Everybody else was terrified. They were all shaking and stuff because Goliath is out there doing his thing. And David wasn't even kind of, even a little bit impressed with that big old nine foot tall guy. And we're going to see why here in, in a couple of minutes. But his oldest brother now, who'd been out there, who was also shaking and trembling and all that stuff, saw David, you know, coming out there talking all tough, this little scrawny little kid, man, you know, and he, this is what happened. He, Eliab, now Eliab, verse 28, now Eliab, the oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why would you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence in your heart, for you have come down here to see the battle. Why? What the heck do you think you're doing, man? What makes you think you're needed here? What makes you think you can even attack this giant? And who's taking care of that little measly job that you have there? Did you forget that you have a job that you're supposed to be doing? You're not supposed to be here. You're supposed to be over there. Now, keep in mind, Eliab was battling his own giant, man. And sometimes when we battle giants, instead of taking it out on the giant, we take it out on people around us, man. And usually the people closest to us tend to get the smacking around that the giant's supposed to get. But we're not going to go smack a big old nine foot tall giant because he might shove that javelin right down our throat, right? And so this is what's happening here. So sometimes people can be, can discourage you. So there was this discouragement right here from his own brother. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Why are you getting on my case, man? There's this big old nine foot tall creature out there yelling all this stuff at our God. And talking smack about Israel. I mean, what are you mad at me for? Turn around, buddy, and face that giant on your own. Well, he was like, heck no, man, I ain't going to do that. So he's like, get out of here, you little snot. I'll give you a fresh one. And David, so, so, he, so look what happened. After David said, you know, what, what have I done? Look what David did. Here's a lesson in this. Then he turned from him toward another. So when there's, when there's opposition coming at you and there's people just you know, chopping you down, you're trying to stand up, you're trying to do the thing, and you got the stuff going on. Arguing with that person or trying to have a debate with them is counterproductive, man. They got their own giants to deal with, and we need to get the mentality in our brain to understand that whatever angst is coming toward us from them, maybe it doesn't have as much to do with us as we take it. Sometimes we take it all personal when someone's, you know, getting all sideways with us. Look, man, we can just turn aside, and this is what it says here. He turned, uh, where did I lost my part? He turned from them toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. It, there's a really great lesson here that sometimes God, sometimes God sets up the scene in such a way that you have nowhere to turn but to him. When you finally, you know, figure it out and you stop making excuses and this and that, eventually you start seeing that narrow road like that sign right in front of you. That road gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And there's dad at the end going, come here, I want to talk to you. And you're like, but, and bam, the road gets narrower. You're like, okay, here I come. Now, when the words of David spoke, when the words of David spoke were heard, they reported, they were, okay. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they were, Oh, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. So the people that were hearing all that stuff went and tattled on him, man. They ratted him out. Here in, in our time, we call it gossip. Unfortunately, praise God, we don't deal with that around here, you know. But there are places and other churches out there that deal with gossip, man. And you know who they want to gossip to sometimes? Sometimes they want to go to the pastor. And in this case, they went to Saul. They went right to Saul. They go, you hear what that little snot saying? My, why, I can't believe it. He's like getting like all froggy with this. He ain't going to go out there and fight that guy, man. And, you know, you need to talk to him about it. Oh, Lord have mercy, man. So David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go fight with this Philistine. Hey, now, that, that was almost fighting words in and of itself because all these mighty men, you know, warriors and stuff like that, not one of them were going to step out, man. And every time that giant came out, they all step back a little bit and start trembling and stuff like that. And this little squirt comes up there and goes, hey, don't sweat it, man. I got this. Put me in, coach. I'll take care of this guy. And look at the response here. And Saul said to David, enter or add in their sarcastic laugh in the little parenthesis things. You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're a youth. You're just a kid. What the heck are you thinking, man? And he's a man of war since he was a kid. 
you're a man of sheep. He's a man of war. You go out there and smack the bottoms of little ah, sheep's running around. This guy's been killing people since he was like your age, man. What do you think you're going to do? And look what, look, what, look what David said here. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it. That's a highlight line right there in terms of fighting giants. All right. Remember your past victories. What David did when he encountered a bear or a lion, he said, I went out after it and I struck it. I didn't let him chase me around. I didn't go hide behind rocks. I didn't go tear wool out of sheep and put it all over me and uh, try to pretend to be a lamb, which would be a stupid idea since that's what they were trying to eat, right? But anyway, he says, I went after it and I struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. So he yanked the sheep out of that lion's mouth of that bear's claws. The bear turned around and went, what the heck are you doing? And he'd reach up and snatch him by his goatee, man, take his staff, boink, and clock him with it. And the bear would be like, ow, man. And as soon as he looked back, all he saw was David going, choo, 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 and off in a rock, pinned that lion or that bear right in the forehead, boom, dead. So what we're going to see later on is the old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, all right? So he says, I caught it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and be with the Lord. <laughs> I'm going to get the classified ads out and look for a new shepherd. <laughs> Now, to, to get an idea of what David's talking about here, I did a little bit of research because I like doing that sort of thing. Um, an adult male lion teeth can be up to four inches long. That's like that stinking long. And their heads are like, you know, that big around, man. Big, huge teeth. And bears, a grizzly bear, can grow up to nine feet tall and more, about the size of that cross right there. And their claws on the grizzly bear grow up to four inches long, too. So now you got a nine foot tall creature with four inch long claws. And just for a fun fact, the tallest polar bear ever caught or killed, whatever you want to call it, was in Alaska. And it was 11 feet, 11 inches tall. That's higher than that roof right there. Polar bear. Isn't that crazy? It weighed, it weighed like 1,200 pounds or something like that. Apparently it was no, I guess someone shot it. I don't really know. So when David, so when we think about that, a bear that weighs like 1,000 pounds with claws or a lion, you know, that, that's got four inch long fangs and stuff like that. And David is talking about battling them, not from a distance, not like with a 30-odd six at, you know, 200 yards. He's talking about grabbing them by their chin, man, and clocking them on the head, getting them with a stone and stuff like that. This guy to David now, this giant to David, he ain't really that big of a threat. These other giants that David already killed, they not only would have killed him, they would have ate him first. This guy out there is just a big blowhard. You probably, you know, chop him up with a sword or get him with a spear, but it ain't, this, it ain't, he ain't even hairy. Well, I mean, I don't know. Maybe Goliath was hairy. I don't know. I wasn't there. But nonetheless, when David's comparing his past victories, remember the feeling? Remember past victories? When he's comparing the stuff that he's already done to this guy, yeah, he's big, but he really isn't much of a match to a full-grown lion or a full-grown grizzly bear. So these guys are looking at that guy, and he's the most terrifying thing they've ever seen. Guess what? None of them fought a lion or a grizzly bear out there in the wilderness, did they? They all learned how to fight, you know, they're chopping up guys and stuff like that, and that's all good. How would any of those, okay, let me just say this. If these guys were looking at Goliath, and he's just taunting them, you know, come on out, you know, and fight me, and I'll stick you with my 20-pound spear and all that stuff. What do you think any of those men of war would have done if they were out behind a rock, you know, digging a leak or something like that, and they turned around, and there was a nine-foot bear standing behind them? They would probably think, I would rather fight Goliath right now than fight this nine-foot-tall bear. Well, David had already done it. 
because David had a secret weapon. Here, I'll show you. Go, over, go with me over to uh, 1 Corinthians real quick. 1 Corinthians something. 126. For you see your calling, brethren and sistren, that you may not, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. When that bear and that lion saw David running up there to grab that, they were thinking he was just like a little Scooby snack. You know, maybe dessert after they get done eating the sheep. And like, hey, he's kind of bony frog leg kind of little looking dude, but what the heck, we'll, we'll nibble away on him. They had no idea that he was coming at them in the strength of the Lord, because when David was out there tending those sheep, he was in communion with God. He was talking to God, he was praying with God, he was getting to know God and understanding that God was on his side, and he knew that he, in his own strength, he couldn't take on a lion he couldn't take on a bear. Who would think that? Nobody in this room can. There's some pretty big guys in here, some scary women too, but you're still not going to take on a bear or a lion. But David had a secret weapon. He knew that this verse right here was his secret weapon. They didn't expect it. It was a surprise to them because they all, and, and Goliath's going to do the same thing. You're going to look at him and go, who the heck do you think you are? Just like Saul did, just like Eliab did, just like all the other guys did. And certainly Goliath, like, who the heck are you going to come out here and fight me, man? Are you crazy? That's the secret weapon. Because God's going to use that little package, and he's going to do some big stuff. Furthermore, has anybody in here ever bought dynamite? Besides, okay. I've heard people can buy dynamite. And it comes in small packages. That was a big, long way around to get to that, right? Dynamite comes in small. It used to be a t-shirt or something like that. Anyway, yeah. But a stick of dynamite, it's only, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen a stick. Has anybody ever played with dynamite but me? Okay, apparently I'm the only one. In the room. Oh, you have played with dynamite? Really? What, a little dynamite, like a firecracker? <laughs> that's called a firecracker. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's cool. You call it what you want. You know, look at it through the binoculars, and oh, it looks like a big old stick of dynamite. All right, that's cool. Okay. I've had, I've had the opportunity to play with dynamite years ago, and it is big. and I mean, it goes boom, big, right? But it, it looks like a little road flare. That's all it is. It's just like a little road flare. But, woo, they don't call it TNT for nothing, man. But anyway, it, it's deceptive is what I'm saying. It doesn't look all that dangerous. You throw a stick of dynamite here on the ground, and you'd be like, oh, big firework, no big deal. But it would blow this whole building. Like, this whole room would be, like, in another area code somewhere probably. A lot of power packed in that. Well, the same thing with David, and he knew it. There was a lot of power packed within him, and we're going to see that in the next part here. But look at this. And the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Not even Goliath can stand before God and say, man, I defy your God. That was a bad thing to say by the way on Goliath's part but what God the secret weapon that God has right here is that he'll use the low things the base things you know the things that aren't people that aren't real mighty and powerful financially or whatever the heck society wants to call it and he'll use things that are that are foolish like me for instance to confound the wise and I'm sure that I do confound I confounded that uh, guard Where's uh, Martha? I know Martha's here somewhere, right? Martha? Martha? No, that's not Martha. Anyway, um, to go see her daughter, and I went, I went up there and told the guard I was the pastor, and he's like, you're a pastor? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, let's see your ID, and I pulled out my driver's license. He goes, no, your clergy ID. And I'm like, well, they didn't give me one of those there. And he goes, and you're a pastor. And right about then, Martha comes down, she goes, oh, pastor. And I turn around, look at the dude. <laughs> And he just looks down and starts writing <laughs> the foolish things to confound the wise right there. And believe me, that ain't my first rodeo with that one right there. For some reason, you just have so much trouble with this package right here, man. I don't know. But anyway, he, said, he goes on to say that no flesh should glory in his presence. God Almighty isn't called God Almighty for nothing. Amen. 
So let's go back to the battle now and the last fill-in. Choose your weapons well in your battle against giants. Face them and name them. And then remember those past victories. It's super important that you remember the stuff you've been through. Stuff that was a giant at that moment. But look, here you are today. Maybe your giant was drug abuse. Maybe it was alcoholism. Maybe it was a bad life that you were living. Whatever it was, whatever happened, you gave your life to Christ and something changed. He used the foolish to confound the wise. When people looked at you, they said, there ain't no way you're going to make it. There's no way you're going to be okay in life. And then here you are years later and they're still looking at you going, eh, just a scam. Any minute now, the, you know, the shoe's going to fall and everything's going to, the bottom's going to fall out. Well, there's a lot of people in my life that are still confounded, actually. My brother just showed up from Arizona today and that was really cool. He was one of them that was just certain that I would be dead before like 30 or most everybody I knew thought I'd be dead before I was 30. And here I am, 43 now, and still alive. Right? Huh? Right? I'm dyslexic in that whole number thing, man. Yeah. No, that, no, that wouldn't work because that'd make me 85 if I was doing. I'm 58 years old. Can you believe that? I'm like old as dirt, man, and I'm still here. Hallelujah. All right, well, anyway, that's okay. Check out the last one. Choose your weapons well, okay? In our battle against giants. And we're talking about David, but I'm talking to you personally about your giants. Name them, face them, and then remember the victories that you've had. It's super important to remember that. That's what David just did. He's like going, you guys think I can't take this guy on? I kill bears and lions, man, with my hand. I grab them and pop them, man. This dude out here, he nothing, man. You guys are all freaking out over nothing. But, but even more so, he's defying our God. He's defying Israel, and I ain't having it, man. There's a little skinny dude standing there you know, with Saul. I ain't having it, man. I want to go out there and take care of it. And Saul, Saul was like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Go with God. You're going to die right now, boy. But look what happens here. It's such a cool part. Um, let's see. Where the heck was it? Um, 38. We're going to go to 38. I'm going to find 38. And it's uh, somewhere around here. Oh, here it is. Okay. So, so Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head a man's helmet on a kid's head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. And David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I can't walk in these. And he goes, for I haven't tested them. Not that that would have mattered. The sword was right dragging on the ground, the tip of the sword. The helmet was falling down over his head. If you can picture a little kid in like a grown man's armor, that's pretty much what was going on here. So David took it off. And, and first of all, see, see, understand something here. And we're going to see it in the very last verse. There's people that, that can't fathom fighting a battle through God. They have to fight it in their own strength. It's the only way they know how to fight battles. And they fight them and fight them and fight them and fight them and fight them their whole lives. Because they're fighting with the, with the weapons of man. They're not fighting with the weapons of God. And, and for us, most of the battles that we fight, the sucky part is, I mean, if it was a person, you know, that was standing in front of you, you take a shotgun, pow, battle's over, man. I mean, it works. It's effective, just saying. But they're not flesh and blood, man. The, and, and more often, they're in our heads, man. The, the giants exist within our brains, man. So you have to figure out another. Look, you just sit there and punch yourself, man, and, you know, go to battle and pound yourself in the face, which I don't recommend, man. I've seen people do that out there, and I still see people running around San Bernardino beating on themselves and thinking, man, they got giants in their head, and they're not accomplishing anything by doing that. So these weapons of warfare that are man weapons, they're, they're completely useless against the giants that we're talking about tonight. And they would have been useless against that giant there because David couldn't even use them. He wouldn't even be able to move around. He wouldn't even be able to maneuver. They would be a hindrance to him fighting the giant. The David already knew how he was going to fight that giant. This was Saul's way and the army's way of fighting with, with Goliath, but it was completely ineffective. How many of those guys ran out there to fight Goliath with their swords? None. 
They were all back there trembling and holding each other. I'm scared, hold me. <laughs> that would have been a disturbing sight, right? So look what happens here. He took all that stuff off, and then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones for the brick, and he put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. He used the very weapons that God had already proven to him were effective because David knew the secret. The secret was that his weapons were being powered by God, not him. He was just an instrument, a willing vessel for God Almighty. And he'd taken on bears, and he'd taken on lions. Who knows what else he'd take? Maybe some robbers or whatever the heck was out there. We just got the stories of the two biggest creatures that he would have took on because he's trying to tell Saul, this guy ain't nothing compared to a big old giant bear or a big old lion. So instead of trying to go out there and fight like a warrior in the army of Israel, he went out there and fought like, an, like a warrior in the army of the Lord of hosts. And, and he was fighting with spiritual weapons. Even though the stone was real and the staff was real, in David's heart, these were weapons of God. And whatever he used was going to be directed and used by God. So check out what happened here. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And and, and the man who bore the shield went before him. That was, that was uh, Goliath's little shield bearer, who was probably really grateful, by the way, that it wasn't some big guy from Israel that was coming out there to you know, battle with him, or that that guy came with a shield bearer too. They're probably going to have to have some fisticuffs of their own. He looked out there and saw this little scrawny kid with a staff and a little sling in his hand, right? And he's like, whoo, shoo, this is going to be an easy one. You know, you need to duck and bob and weave or nothing, man. But he was, fortunately, he was smaller than, than uh, Goliath because he might have got clocked himself. But nonetheless, God had a plan. God was going to do the very same thing that he did with the lion and the bear because, and David knew it, because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. By putting all this armor that Saul was trying to give him and the helmet and the shield and the sword and all that stuff, he was going to break what wasn't broke. So look what happens here. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth. Here we go again. People getting on David for trying to take on the giant. And the giant himself was going, you can't beat me. You've never been able to beat me. What makes you think you're ever going to not be depressed? What makes you think you're ever not going to be broke? What, what, who, who is speaking to you to make you think that you're ever going to defeat the grief that's in your life? We are one. We are the world. I am your world. This is how it's always going to be. And that's how it is when we're fighting giants, man. They, just when you think you're going to start taking a couple steps toward fighting them, their giant itself starts coming down on you, man, and telling you, What's, what are you thinking? When have you ever been tough, tough enough to take me? Well, look what happens here. He looked at When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking, by the way. Apparently, Goliath was ugly. And they could have at least sent me an ugly kid to come out here and do this stuff. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Who do you think you are, Winona? You think you're going to take me on with a little stick? You're going to hit me with your Bible? Is that what you're going to do? That's what these giants do, man. They're like, You're inadequate. You don't have what it takes. That's why I'm the giant and you're the uh, little smear on the floor. Bobbles around and cries and weeps and big old mess right there, man. <laughs> what makes you think you can get up off the floor and take me? Here's a little food for thought. Giants understand spiritual warfare and they know what can kick their butts. And they're going to do everything they can because these giants come from a realm that ain't of God, but it is a realm. But it's a realm from the other side. So if it comes from the other side, the other side already knows how the book ends. It already knows where defeat comes from. So a giant's going to taunt you and do whatever you can to keep you down. And that's really food for thought. And these giants that you're battling with right now, they're from the other side of the camp, the other side of the Valley of Elah. Amen? And that side already knows that it's defeated. So it's going to try every trick in the book to try to get you to not focus on the fact that you're coming from God's side and that the battle's already been won. And we fall for that trick every single time. 
with these giants that we can't defeat this. Well, it's already a defeated foe. We're the ones standing between the victory. Duh, right? So look at this. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. You think you got it bad now? I'm going to make your life miserable, man. I'm going to, I'm going to grind on you. I'm going to twist you and snap you and break you. I'm going to shove this thing eh, right in your ear, poke it out your eyeball. I'll give your eyes to the ravens, man, so they can eat them. I'm going to mess you up. He's like, okay, okay, I'm sorry. What was I thinking, man? I'll just be in depression. I'll just stay over here being anxious and freaking out. I'll worry about jobs and relationships and grief. I'll just, let's just keep things the way it is right now. And John's like, now you're thinking straight. Come over here. I got a fresh one for you, just for good measure. Look what David said. And David's, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin? That's the best you got? Are you serious, you big old bonehead? He goes, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you defied. You're in big trouble, mister. You picked a fight with dad now. Yeah, you think that spear and that javelin, that big old 20-pound spearhead right there is going to scare my dad? He made you. And you're about to get your big green butt kicked right now. He says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you, and I'll take your head from you. You're going to feed me to the birds? I'm going to chop your stinking head off, you big old... Uh. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines. He's saying that like over, over Goliath's shoulder. Oh, and by the way, you guys back there? Yeah, I'm going to give you to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Now, look, these guys were probably really tripping hard. They weren't getting this stuff from God's army over here in Israel. All they were seeing, they could hear, they could hear their swords and their shields rattling together. <laughs> they were all over there shaking and stuff. They're just laughing and partying up and Goliath's talking. These guys are over there. Even, even Saul, man, he was back there hiding. And this little dude out front going, man, I'm going to feed you to the birds. In fact, you know what? I'm going to chop the big guy's head off first. And then I'm going to feed all of you to the birds. They, they probably were just like, what? Then you go back to 1 Corinthians 126. The God used the foolish to confound the wise and the weak to, to disarm the mighty. They were just looking at this kid going, and, and you know, they're still looking, he's still a little guy, right? And Goliath's a big guy, but it causes pause. The second you turn and face a giant in the strength of God, the giant's gonna take pause. Because as soon as that giant gets it through his head that you're standing with God now, in fact, you're standing behind God, and you're like going, Lord, get him. That giant already knows, I'm already defeated. I just lost all the leverage that I had on him or her, and now I'm screwed, dude. And guess what? He was about to be. Check it out. Then it says, so it was. The Philistine arose and came and drew near to David, that David hurried and ran toward the army of the Philistine. He didn't bob and weave, you guys. Remember the story over here when he was talking about the lions and stuff? It says, uh, it says here when... Back over in 34. You don't need to go there, though. A bear came and took the lamb out of the flock. David says, I went out after it and struck it. It ain't broke. Don't fix it. As soon as, as, soon as, as, soon as uh, Goliath started coming toward David and, you know, walking out there, pulling out his sword, doing stuff, David ran right at him. Talk about freaking out. Have you ever had, like, a mouse run at you? And you do that weird, like, <laughs> dance that everybody does. We call it, they call it high-stepping, like in the mountains of the south and stuff and you start doing that ah! all that stuff or if you're in the water at the beach and like a fish brushes on your leg ah! you're all jumping up okay david's running straight at him man and goliath was just kind of what the heck's this little dude and he's running right at him and look what happens here it says david put his hand in his bag and he's running he's trucking he put his hand in his bag pulled out a sling Swung it around, and Goliath's down there with that sword, trying to figure out the, sh the shield bearer's going, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? And David's like, choo, 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 whap. And you just hear this, <laughs> probably didn't sound exactly like that, but that's the only sound I can make right now. That, And look what happened here. It says, 
David put his hand, put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. David, David put his hand in faith and pulled out God. And he slung it and it struck that Philistine right in the forehead. Who else in their right mind would run at a nine foot tall guy with a sword and a spear that weighs that much unless they were running in the strength of God? If they were looking at that giant going, you ain't, you ain't intimidating me anymore. I'm not afraid of you anymore, man. I'm running in the strength of the God. I'm running with the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Man, there ain't nothing that big and bad. When you got that standing behind you and in your heart, man, and that's what David had, the heart of a warrior. But it wasn't just that he was so brave and courageous, which he was. Don't, don't get me wrong. He knew that God was on his side. And if God be with us, who can be against us, right? Even a nine-foot tall giant, man. Even a nine-foot tall giant called depression or grief or fake, fake, whatever the word is I was looking for there. Finances, grief, and fear. Whatever, whatever has you squished up in a ball right now, man, it's time to roll away, first of all, and stand up and face your giant. Call it what it is, and then do what David did here. Go straight to the Lord and go, Lord, I, I can't fight this on my own. This is like out of my reach in the physical realm. And we'll see that here in a second, but let's finish the battle. He stuck it right in his forehead so that the stone sank sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to earth. How many of you right now, if you could see your giant fall flat on his face, would just be elated right now tonight? If whatever your giant is that's going on in your life, if just you could just see that giant, boom, the dust puff out around him right on his stinking ugly face. How many would be okay with that tonight? Wouldn't that be awesome? You guys have all the weapons. Well, maybe not yet. I'm going to show them to you, though, in just a second. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Why was there no sword in the hand of David? Because we got to go back up to the top where David was talking about all this stuff. And it, he said, This day, Lord, was leaving to my hand. I was very... Where was it? Oh, right here. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord is not saved with sword and spear. Then all the assembly knows, then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will put he will give you into our hands. David didn't need a sword or a shield. He had the Lord. And he already told this guy up there. He told him clearly, I don't need a sword to kill you. And guess what? He didn't, right? He needed faith and a little stone. Can you imagine? This guy goes up against swords and spears and Arrows and all kinds of stuff. Goliath, you know, the big warrior battling all this stuff like that. And a little kid with a little rock took him out. And you're like, well, that's impossible. I, I would beg to differ because I actually can prove it if you want me to, if there's any brave souls in here. I have a slingshot in my office. <laughs> wow. And I got these little, they're like, uh, they're like clay ball bearings. And I will show you how much damage that little slingshot. It's not even a sling. It's just a little pow, slingshot. Will you take one for the team? Why are you pointing at each other? The heck, man. No, I'm going to play David. You're going to play. You're going to stand on a chair. You'll be like eight feet tall. Don't sweat it, man. Better yet, we'll put you on a table so when you fall off, it'll be more dramatic. Okay? Yeah, a rock in the head works, man. It'll do some damage, all right? Has anybody ever been hit with a rock in the head? I've been hit with several rocks in the head, and they hurt too, right? Well, this thing was coming like a dang bullet, man. You know those slings? Those things are pretty, they're pretty effective, man. There's a lot of energy, kinetic energy when that thing goes. And if you learn how to use it, especially in the power of God, they can be pretty vicious and deadly. So anyway, so he didn't have a sword. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword. And this is really important. All the stuff that these giants hold over you, we're going to kill them with their own stuff yeah. and, and end it, though. Not just knock them down with a rock and stuff like that. You've got to be willing to get in the battle all the way through. And you know, when we talk to the Lord about it, going, I'm not going to like this. It's not going to be fun. It's going to suck. It's going to be a drag. But this is worse. So let's go. And you've got to stay in the fight all the way through. Yes, of course, God's going to be with us through the whole thing. But we got to get our hands a little bit bloody, too, sometimes when we're fighting giants. You know, that's part, of, that's part of growing in the Lord, defeating the giant with God, and then it becomes part of your history, part of those 
victories that we remember that we went through because you got to remember the victories that's a big problem that we have just so you know we forget victories and we forget blessings because we get on with our lives life gets busy and stuff like that and we forget how much we've been blessed over the years and all the battles that we've been in i mean if you could get a look at your spiritual armor you'd probably be surprised at how many arrows are sticking out of it and dents and axes and all kinds of other stuff in battles that we fought and we just like get tunnel vision on life we just get it's so all we see is what's right, and all you see is like a big shin. And you're like, oh my God, that is one big giant right there. And that's all you got because of the tunnel vision. You got to remember the victories. So look what David did. He took a sword, drew it out of his sheath, and he killed him, cut his head off with it. Killed that giant dead. That giant wasn't coming back. Giants, giants don't do well without heads. They just kind of wander around, running into stuff. <laughs> okay. Way too much uh, walking, watch, walking dead. Is that what it's called? Okay. Anyway, remember the army? Remember, remember the stuff that, that stands behind all the giants, but the, behind the fear or behind grief, there's fear and anxiety. Behind relationships, there's depression. Behind jobs, there's finances. There's always something behind your giant that you can see, and you're like, how am I supposed to defeat? I'm like, fight him, I got to fight them, and I got to fight them, and I got to, well, look what happened. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled because he was dead. Bye, Fred. He fled. I can do this all night long, man, because I am not going to cancel Dr. Seuss. No, I'm not. Okay, how did he pull this off, though, this little guy? We have to go from the physical to the spiritual. Now, go with me over to Ephesians. Ephesians something. Six, another famous verse here. Finally, my brethren and sisters, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's step one. We, we're strong in his power and his might, not our stinking own. Amen. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil or Goliath. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of the age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. What do you swing a sword against that? How do you swing a sword against spiritual warfare? You're not going to hit anything with it. For one, you're swinging your own sword in your own strength. Swing a sword in the power of God. Well, it's just like that sling that David had. Look what it says here. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you'll be able to withstand the evil in the evil day, and having done all to stand. That spiritual armor. David was more armored up than Goliath was when he went into the Valley of Elah. They couldn't see it. Nobody could see it. But David knew it was there. And God definitely knew it was there. Maybe if, if, if Goliath could have seen how well armored up David was, he might have thought twice about jumping into that valley with David. He might have been a little bit scared of David, but it was too late because giants are dumb. They're dumb that way. They're just big, dumb, narcissistic animals, man. They want to hold you down and press you down and twist you around so that you can't think straight. If they could see your, your armor for what it really is, they'd run for their lives. I'm sure that, well, you saw what happened to that army. They saw what it, when they saw David take out Goliath, man, they saw the armor. They saw God is what they saw. They saw the one true God Almighty in that one little dude right there, and they burned. Why, would, why else would they run from a little guy with a sling and a stick in his hand right there? They knew that what David had said was true, that he came in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel, and they went, we are in big trouble. We need to get out of here. And they left Goliath, big old bonehead or well, no head, laying there in the middle of the valley, and they burned rubber. Then you know what all the guys did from Israel? They're like, get them! Oh, now they're all brave. Ah! And they all run across the valley, chase them down. They're like, they're all high-fiving David as they go by. Yeah, David! And David's there, yeah, sucking through the bone and the sinew. Get that big old bloody head in his hand, man. And they chased them all, man. They were chopping them up. Oh, now they were big and bad guys, yeah. Took a little dude in the power of God to give them some strength to go chasing this army down. And that army ran all the way, like a long ways away. They chased them all the way through the valley, chopping them up as they went. Big victory for Israel. It was a big victory for David. Because you know who David was? 
He was the king of Israel, man. Not at that moment, but he was going to be the king, appointed by God long before this battle ever took place. We just read about David in Isaiah, that probably a few hundred, 500 years maybe, before this event ever took place. We read it in the book of Isaiah. More history here, you guys. But anyway, there's something that David knew that you need to know. I, I brought it up last week, as a matter of fact. It's it's 911. 911. Psalm 91 1. 911. Our Christian 911. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. David dwells in the secret place with God out there in those fields with all those sheep. He would commune and talk and worship. Play music to him. David was a jamster, man. I don't know if you guys knew that. He was a musician. A really good guitar player, man. I think Stevie Ray was part of his lineage, maybe. Just saying. Just saying. But when it comes to the battles, he was under the shadow of the Almighty. So when he stepped into the Valley of Elah, he wasn't tripping out on nothing, man. He already knew the battle was won. And that's where we got to get with our giants. We need to look at them and go, you're already done for, man. You should be running right now is what you should be doing. And the second we can chop the head off that giant, man, all of a sudden, the grip of anxiety and the grip of fear and the grip of grief, these things just run. Just like that army did, they're gone. And, and you can kind of like everything clears up in front of you. And all of a sudden you're like, Man, what the heck was I thinking? What the heck was I doing? Staying in that same stinking broken spot, man. And I know how to dial 911. It's right here. And we do dwell in the secret place, or we should be. Amen? Sometimes we step out of the secret place, and boy, you step out of that secret place, and you're on your own. And I got to tell you something, man. You are fair game for the enemy at that point right there. Think you got giants in your life right now? Step out of God's will and see what happens to you. And he will let that happen according to his will, whatever happens to you out there. And it'll leave a mark, I'm here to tell you right now. It's way better under the shadow. Amen? Under the shadow of the Almighty. Giants fear the shadow of the Almighty. They won't come anywhere near the shadow of the Almighty. Here's the last person. I'm going to let you guys go. I'm sorry. This is such a good story. Okay, here's the last one. It's over in Revelation 3. And it goes like this. This is Jesus speaking. And the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness. I love that. The beginning of the creation of God. All these titles for Jesus, man. Isn't that cool? I know your works, that you are neither cold or hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, I have no need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy, buy for me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich. White garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness not, may not be revealed. That the, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with the eye salve that you may see. What we call wealth. Is fake, man. It's not real. And, and sometimes just to impress ourselves or to make ourselves think something different, but we're naked. Our, our shame, the fact that just so you know, people around you can see things that you don't think they can see. And Jesus is going, look, man, clothe yourself in righteousness so that you're, you're not out there bare. But put this on your eyes so you can see because you blinded yourself from that stupid giant right there. That's all you see every day. You wake up, you see the giant. You go to sleep, you see the giant. You wake up the next morning, oh, there's your giant. Enough with the giant, man. We need to go to sleep seeing Jesus, man, and wake up the next morning seeing Jesus. That's what needs to happen for us. But we get these giants, and he goes, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And if you're not being chastened by God, you, you need to really take a look at your relationship with him, man. Because God chases and rebukes those that he loves. I promise you. <laughs> he loves me. <laughs> he loved me like a rock. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Therefore, be zealous and repent. 
I'm not going to let this giant control me anymore. That's what we tell God tonight. I'm not going to let this giant run me no more. I've heard something. Now I'm accountable to it. I know how it works. I'm not going to, I'm going to turn away. I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn away from this giant. I'm going to look at you, God, and go, what do you want me to do? And you're going to pick up that rocket and throw it in his face. Okay, pick it up. Bow, and down goes the giant. You're like, wow, that's all it took? All these years I've been putting up with this guy? What was I thinking? He goes like this, and this is for everyone here tonight. Behold, Jesus speaking, not me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Here I am. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in with him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down my father on his throne. Jesus is here tonight for all of you giant slayers. If there's stuff in front of you, that's not me knocking. That's Jesus Christ going, I'm here. You want to fight this giant now? You want to get this over with? Let's deal with it right here tonight. Amen. And he goes on like this at the end. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Well, you're the church. The Spirit's talking to you tonight. I recommend you act upon it. At some point, you need to stop being bullied by this stinking giant. Amen. And deal, just deal with it. Here's your, here's your application tonight. Faith is the most powerful weapon we have. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let's give the Lord some praise. He's awesome. I'm sorry I kind of went a little bit late, but hit me with a rock. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, and we thank you for the giant stuff. Lord, you give us giant stuff. You give us giant faith, giant weapons, giant spiritual warfare, Father. You battle this for us, Lord. Tonight, Father, help us to deal with these giants in our life. Once and for all, tonight, we hear you knocking, and we want you to come in, Lord. We want to invite you in. We want to deal with giants tonight, Lord. And as we pray, Father, Lord, I ask that you give everyone in this room the strength to stand just as David did, to run straight at those giants, Lord, reach in their bag of faith and pull out that stone and knock that sucker down. And Lord, I pray that tonight people can leave here lopping the heads right off those giants, that they don't have to go to sleep seeing that giant and they don't have to wake up tomorrow morning seeing that giant. Father, I have blessings upon everybody in this room here, Father, blessings for healing, Blessings for their minds, their bodies, their spirits, Father, that tonight, Lord, something changes in them before they walk out this door, that they can leave here something different than they did when they came in tonight, Lord. And our desire is that everybody knows your Son is Savior. And so, Father, as we close tonight, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit move through this room, through that camera, out into TV land, and touch the hearts of those that are lost right now, Father, those that are facing giants in their own strength out there in the world, Lord. Father, we ask that, that you draw them in by the blood of Christ into this sheepfold, Father, that they might know your Son as Savior. So as we pray, Father, we ask your Holy Spirit to have his way in Jesus' name. Let's all pray. Father God, I sin against you, Lord, and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. To fill me with your Holy Spirit and put me on that road that you'll have me travel. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go kill some giants tonight. Pow. Amen. I know you got giants. Don't let that giant live another day. I'm here to tell you. Don't let that giant of depression, fear, failure, whatever you want to name your giant, leave here tonight with that giant having a name and go kick its butt. Amen. I'll see you next time. Keep your eyes on Jesus. God bless you guys. Hey, amen.